Hello and welcome everyone to the Double Loop Podcast, your source for everything having to do with fingerprints. While you're working on your comparisons, we'll talk about comparisons. We'll even evaluate everything, even evidence. I'm Eric Ray. And I'm Glenn Langenberg. And Glenn, you're joining us all the way from Switzerland, uh, so welcome again. Thank you very much. Good to hear you. How are things uh, over there on the continent? Uh, rainy again. Very rainy this weekend, but uh, managing. We had a nice little weekend, uh, you know, for those that you know, I've said, you know, I'm teaching over here with Alice Maceo, and so she's been posting a lot of pictures to Facebook. A lot of my pictures would look the same, so she's just posting. I'm not really bothering. <laughs> um, but so if people want to see what it looks like, go to Alice's face page. Uh, great. Uh, you know, like I said on last week's, week's episode, I went up to a conference in Utah, got to see some, uh, some of this crazy white stuff called snow, I'm told, and uh, uh, could see it on the mountains the whole time, but it actually snowed in town briefly one morning. That was nice. Hmm. <laughs> but it's been a while since you've seen snow. Oh, well, yeah, a little bit. Uh, don't get much here down in Phoenix, but that's okay. I haven't shoveled a driveway, I think, ever. So. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Well, uh, Glenn, a uh, couple things to, to catch up on from the uh, last couple episodes. Uh, the article that we talked about last week, uh, the article from myself and Penny Deccant, uh, is now out. We've got, at least I've got my copy, and uh, already starting to get some feedback from that. So it's really great to see uh, you know, some people are reading it and are seeing something of value there. Uh, and what, uh, what kind of feedback are you getting so far? Mostly positive, negative, we hate your guts, what are you thinking? Mostly positive and uh, an opportunity to kind of look over what you know procedures and protocols different agencies have and and uh, at least just giving them a chance to to think about maybe uh, what other options are out there to, of how they might they might improve their practices and maybe not necessarily going with exactly what we're doing but at least taking a hard look at their protocols and that's what we were going for um, in the first place so it's it's great okay good also to uh, to recap from. The, uh, the British Columbia case. Uh, there's some uh, discussion going on uh, over the past week or two about uh, kind of the roles of you know, the judge and jury to evaluate the evidence and either to uh, do their own comparisons uh, on latent prints presented in court and whether that's uh, an appropriate use of, uh, of that position. So there's some saying you know, they should never do their own comparison because they're not, uh, they're not trained. There's you know, studies that show how often mistakes are made and others that are um, arguing a different point that that's kind of their role in this system uh, to, to take a look themselves and see what, whether or not the evidence, even the uh, charts presented in court, are convincing. Yeah, I, I, I saw those posts and, you know, there is interesting... Uh, back and forth between you know an attorney Lisa Steele, you know, she's an appellate attorney, and then various other obvious practitioners who are sounding off. You know, I mean, it's an interesting discourse. I I get the point about that it's the jury or fact finders' responsibility to accept or reject and how much weight to put to the evidence. I still have a different take on it when it comes down to them essentially recreating an exam or attempting to repeat an exam or do their own exam. You know what I mean? To me that's different than assigning weight or rejecting some evidence or believability. It's it's different when they, it's not like he's rejecting fingerprint science. He's saying in this specific case the examiner made a mistake and I or he's not convinced that the examiner didn't make a mistake. Right, right. Yeah, I, that's that's where I have an issue. I mean, it's it's really overstepping one's overstepping one's expertise, I think, and 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 duties. Yeah, I think I'd feel more comfortable if the judge or the jury, well, I guess a judge more is the point in this case, uh, were to you know, find another expert that they could give the comparison to and maybe walk through with that expert. Uh, but I'm not sure if that's something that's ever really come up, at least in American courts. Well, you know, the other thing that came to mind was the McKee uh, fingerprint print inquiry report, which, you know, obviously this judge in the BC case cited. And, you know, here you have this committee of people who listen to testimony over, you know, what, nine months, you know, up, you know over a period of. I mean, listen to all these different people. And in the end, these non-experts made a definitive decision to state that, you know, the McKee identification 
the Y7, the, you know, the mark on the, the door frame was in fact an erroneous identification. And they also came down and said that the, the mark on the tin was an erroneous identification. So I guess there is some precedence for lay people to, ha you know, have an authority on, on this, but again, it, I, mm, it's different than me than weighing the evidence in something as opposed to making their own, I guess, final decision on what the truth of the identification is. And do you see where I'm coming from? Yeah, yeah, and that it, a little different in the BC case because there was no set of uh, experts arguing the other direction against the identification but uh right good point uh yeah there i guess there does seem to be this a practitioner is never going to be the final word in in some instances on whether or not an identification is acceptable which is really strange but uh that seems to be the way at least in mckee in this case in bc uh, i remember hearing Years, a couple years ago, I think, about a, an identification in the FBI where the examiners disagreed on uh, sufficiency, not on, on whether or not uh, it was an ID or an exclusion. And it, I think it essentially came down to the director of the lab, not a fingerprint expert, making the call on what the lab would report out. Hmm. I, I'm not aware of that. Anyway, it's interesting uh, discussions, and I hope that those in the uh, in the judicial world or in the uh, the law arena are careful in when they actually go about their comparisons. Yeah, I I mean again back to the BC case. I just I still sort of feel if the judge wanted to take a position, he could have simply said, "I don't feel comfortable convicting someone on on a single fingerprint identification alone." You know, in a way, he would have said that the weight of the evidence is not overwhelming enough to me, you know, to to convict this person. And I, I and I could I could accept that. But again, for and I'll tell you, if it was DNA, he would have convicted them. If his DNA profile was on a blood stain <laughs> in that house, that guy would be in jail. But you know, it's because it's fingerprints and because he can look at it in himself, and there's this controversy behind it. You know, anyway, um, uh, I'm still saying it's going to get overturned. Well, Glenn, uh, earlier this week, uh, you had a chance to sit down with, uh, with someone over there in Switzerland, uh, Pierre Margot. Yes, uh, Professor Pierre Margot, who is the current director of the Institute, well, it's, it's in French, but IPS, it's uh, Institut Police Scientifique, uh, the Scientific Police Institute, so it's the forensic department, forensic criminal sciences uh, department at the University of Lausanne here. So that's going to be coming up next here is your interview with, uh, with him. Uh, for, for part of the interview, you talk about uh, Archibald Rice, is that right? Yeah, uh, Rice, uh, R-E-I-S-S, -S, was the founder of the institute. And so I was kind of curious, uh, for those that know Pierre, he's, he's a storyteller. He knows an, an amazing amount of history and stories. And uh, he's, he's very entertaining. He's very soft-spoken. He's very entertaining. And uh, so I wanted to ask him a little bit about Heiss and his background and, and how, um, you know, how the school got founded. So, yeah, he, uh, he has some good stories about that. Well, great. Well, let's uh, start up the interview and uh, let all the listeners uh, hear what, uh, what Professor Margot has to say. So I'm here at the University of Lausanne in Lausanne, Switzerland, with Professor Pierre Margot, uh, Professor Pierre Margot was um, one of the professors who was on my doctorate committee and have reviewed my thesis. You had the record, sir, for the number of uh, edits, suggested edits. I think you were well over 400, which I hear for you are, is, is actually a very small, small number. So uh, I had the opportunity uh, to sit down with Pierre today and ask him some questions um, about the university, the institute, and his background. And so I'm just going to start off with, um, first of all, uh, Pierre, thank you for taking the time to... You're welcome. It's a pleasure. Yeah, thank you. And if you don't mind telling the listeners uh, a little bit about your career and the various places you've worked uh, prior to coming to the, the institute here. Well, actually, I started at the Institute because I did my first degree within this Institute uh, a long time ago now, 
Uh, it's almost 40 years now that I've been uh, a student here. And uh, it, it, it was a very interesting field because it was already very interdisciplinary which means that you had chemistry, you had physics, you had mathematics, but at the same time you had law, you had technology like uh, imaging. And um, so that that was already fascinating for a student uh, that was not focused on one specific uh, type of uh, scientific endeavor. Sure. Uh, was that pretty common back then to have a more varied background? As a, as no, that was very rare. So even if the school is more than 100 years old, uh, we were very few students. And in fact, we were only two graduating in my, in my year. So uh, <laughs> that, was a, uh, that was a very small class, if we can call that a class. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, who, who was the other student you graduated with? Well, I, you don't know him no. because he hasn't been uh, he hasn't been publishing or anything like that. Okay. But, uh, he is still practicing. He's uh, he's member of the um, um, uh, judicial um, laboratory in Geneva. Mm. So that's the laboratory that is linked to the to the court in Geneva. I'm just picturing your uh, reunion, <laughs> <laughs> which I imagine is just a quiet talk at, at the bar. Yes, yes, that would be. Uh, so, and during the studies, I had the chance to go to the UK, to, uh, to Birmingham. And at the time, in Birmingham, there was one of the major um, uh, British laboratory and uh, it was intended to be only three months attachment during summer as a student attachment. But while I was there, one of the employee who was using a technique I was familiar with fell ill and I was asked to stay a bit longer. Uh, so I stayed a bit longer. And while I was staying longer, we had the first uh, terrorist attack by the IRA in Birmingham. Mm. So that was a problem for the uh, the British government because there was a Swiss in the middle of their laboratory uh, with an internal security uh, problem. Right. And then they decided to keep me because it was two extra hands to work through the... <laughs> Uh, through this case, so which means I spent six months at the time there, and I found out that there was a program in uh, in Glasgow, Scotland, uh, that was teaching a number of things uh, and a, a number of fields which were a bit different to what I was accustomed to in in Lausanne. So I decided to go and do my master's degree there, and while uh, doing my master, uh, the uh, director there, who was the founder of the school in, uh, in Glasgow, asked me to stay for a PhD, mm -hmm. which I did. But then my supervisor left, which meant that I was without a supervisor, and I had the opportunity to take some of the teaching that the professor had left. So I took a, a, a small portion of teaching at the time and uh, finished my PhD almost by myself. Wow, wow. <laughs> so then it took, well, I went for a postdoc in the U.S. And, and if, you, if I can interrupt, the focus of your PhD was? Well, that was on poisonous and hallucinogenic mushrooms. So that was a request from the Royal Botanic Garden in Edinburgh because that was a problem in Scotland and they wanted to know what flora was there and what type of poisons were there and what whether they were active also in the hallucinogens. So it was more oriented towards controlled substances rather than uh, general forensic science. Uh, and uh, then ap I applied for various positions in the U.S. for a postdoc. And I had the chance to be um, hired at the uh, um, Center for Human Toxicology in Salt Lake City. Uh, it happens that the 
current editor of the Journal of Forensic Sciences, uh, Mike Pitt, uh, was taking a sabbatical to complete a PhD thesis, and I had the chance to uh, step in his shoes, uh, so to stay, uh, so to say, so so to speak. So I spent two years in Salt Lake City, and there I was mostly working in forensic toxicology. Um, then there was a time where uh, there was a decision to be taken for the future of the carrier because I came back to Switzerland and I didn't really have a position that was ready. Uh, so I applied for a number of positions and I was almost hired by the uh, industry mm. because uh, Nestle was uh, in the process of building a new toxicological laboratory so even if it was not built, they offered to hire me um, two years before the lab would be ready. Wow. So I decided to stay in research because I had got a, a research um, position in the meantime at the Federal Institute of Technology in chemical analysis. So I told Nestlé that I would do further research and I would be available two years later. And that was a very interesting time because uh, it was research in analytical chemistry and uh, that was in the group of uh, Kovacs. Uh, chromatographers will know the name of Kovacs indices. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And uh, so that was the Kovacs of the Kovacs indices and it happened that at the time we had another researcher who was retired in the UK but was pursuing research in the group and that was A.G.P. Martin who was the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 1952 mm. and Nobel Prize for uh, the uh, theory on chromatography. Oh. Okay, so mm. that, that was f a fascinating uh, time because I encountered some of the um, pioneers of separation science and, and chromatography. Uh, well, I had a project there which was more a reverse engineering type of project that was looking at uh, uh, various uh, pharmaceutical uh, products um, sold around the world to try to see what type of active products were used in various brands. So, <laughs> interesting. Uh, so that was a, a more espionage. Uh, yeah, that was a kind of industrial uh, espionage type type work. Uh, and by as a game, I applied for a position that was advertised in Nature, where they ask for a forensic scientist with knowledge in uh, forensic in in chemical analysis. And uh, that was a position in Australia. Mm -hmm. And I applied for fun, <laughs> but then I got the position. <laughs> and it happened that the position was to lead a small group uh, that, was, that had started research on fingerprint detection techniques. Mm -hmm. uh, that was headed first by Hilton Cobus. Mm -hmm. Some people in the fingerprint uh, domain will know the name of Hilton. And Hilton had left to go to the Adelaide lab, and so I took over. And uh, in the group, there was another person well known in the forensic science area that was Chris Leonard, mm. who was a PhD student there in the group, and Milutin Stoilovic, uh, a physicist. And while I was there, um, there was a number of techniques uh, on the detection of fingerprints, especially. Uh, luminescent detection mm -hmm. and the use of alternative light sources and the development of the polylight. Mm -hmm. um, so that was a very rich uh, time and probably I would have stayed in Australia if in the meantime there hadn't been a professorial position in Lausanne. Mm -hmm. And I applied for this position and since then I've been in Switzerland, back at the institute where I started. And that's fantastic. <laughs> I mean, it's quite a journey to, to come back here, but I mean, clearly you love it here and 
I believe the students and the school loves having you here, so <laughs> it's great. Um, just there was something you had mentioned the the, the mushrooms. Uh, yes. That this was you know your PhD. I have heard from some students that you have a particular fascination and hobby of mushrooms. Can you tell the listeners a little bit about yes, about that in, interest? Yes, and in fact, on my desk, if you could see, there the, there is a journal mm -hmm. with the mm -hmm. with the. Uh, uh, red mushrooms with white spots known from uh, uh, fairy tales, etc. Yeah, it's um, and, Mushroom uh, Lovers Monthly. That's right. Uh, in, in fact, that's the Bolton of the Mycological Society of Switzerland. <laughs> okay. And uh, that's true that most weekends in the season when mushrooms are growing, I'm going out foraying and collecting usually uh, to uh, to make food at home uh, in the evening, but also looking at interesting species, some which might be toxic or... <laughs> uh, and so that allows me to go in the woods and uh, have fresh air and at the same time collect and uh, identify a number of species that I see around. And you've done this sometimes with students as well and... Well, that when the institute was smaller, I used to do that with uh, with the teaching assistants. We used to go one day out and do uh, collecting in the morning, then identifying in the afternoon, and then eating in the evening. So that was a fun part. That's that's fascinating. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Well, if you could uh, tell us, uh, the, and us, the listeners, uh, a little bit about the Institute and the program as it is today. Well, uh, uh, well, first, the Institute, when I took over, had only 57 students, and now they are about 600 altogether. And uh, that means we have a Bachelor of Science program, which is heavily based on uh, basic science and chemistry, but also on technology like uh, uh, imaging, microscopy, and fields like that. Um, and uh, the uh, bachelor is a foundation to go to specialization. And at present, we have uh, five specialization, and the sixth one has just started. The five are either in the social science area like uh, criminology or uh, for our magistrate so that's for law students who mm -hmm. want to go into criminal investigation or criminal law uh, then we have a master with um, uh, uh, heavy leaning on uh, chemical criminalistics for one on identification for a second one. A third one that we are preparing is on uh, um, uh, computer computer evidence or digital uh, digital evidence. And we have just started uh, a master with the University of Montreal and the cool School of Criminology. And in fact, there we, we, we have this interdisciplinary social science, hard science uh, master uh, that is, I think, a, a first in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, we are bridging people who have done a bachelor in criminology in Montreal and a bachelor in forensic science in Lausanne. Yeah. And having now a look at how can we use forensic data, forensic science data, uh, in understanding crime phenomena, in crime analysis, and things like that. Right, fascinating. So it's a it's a fascinating development. In, in the tracks that you mentioned, I noticed that there wasn't a DNA biology track. No, because it's all part of the identification. Okay. To us, DNA is just another tool to identify, and to me, uh, most of the DNA that is done today is like making pills in a factory. Uh, you have uh, automatized laboratories, and you have very few difficult cases to handle where you have mixtures and things like that. But, uh, but a lot of the DNA has become industry, and to me is not a forensic science. It's just one type of 
uh, identification uh, material. Right. Okay. Uh, then that wouldn't be complete without saying that we have two PhD programs, one in social science, which is the uh, criminology area, and currently we have 64 PhD students in forensic science. Glenn was one of them. <laughs> I was pleased. <laughs> I, I was pleased uh, to go through the program as well. So, and that makes the around 600 uh, students uh, currently going through the program. That's an, it's, it's an incredible amount. I mean, I, I'm trying to think of some of the other forensic programs in the world, and I can't think of any others that are anywhere near that size. Well, perhaps we had the chance of being the first academic program in the world. Mm. And uh, while others started uh, in Austria, in Germany, uh, in France, most of them uh, died during the First World War and then the Second World War. It must be said that forensic science at one point uh, in between wars had been um, taken over by the Nazi regime in, in Germany and in Austria mm. and were used against their own people. Oh, that's interesting. And uh, so that means that uh, after the Second World War, a number of these programs had difficulties to show that they they had a legitimate uh, scientific endeavor mm. and not only a, a support for a regime right right and uh, i think that was one of the big difficulty in europe and that's why probably forensic science picked up uh, the lead uh, in the uk and in north america mm. after that so we were only the, the only remaining program here uh, in the center of Europe that had survived all this period of time and the, the crisis. Uh, that, that's very interesting. Um, and, and if you don't mind, uh, you know, for those that know you, uh, we all know that you are a great history buff and a lover of history and uh, bring the past very much to the present. And for those of us who, you know, um, you, you keep the past alive. And so if, if you don't mind, uh, share some of the past and the founding of the school and, and uh, talk a little bit about its founder as well. Well, uh, the, the founder was a very interesting character. He was very young when he came to Lausanne and he was uh, a German. by uh, uh, So he came here as a German student in chemistry and he, uh, he had a a hobby that was almost a profession on the side that was photography mm -hmm. and because of his passion for photography and he did artistic photography as well as scientific photography um, he did his research his PhD research in uh, silver chemistry and in photochemistry mm -hmm. that is the the reaction of matter with the light energy and he developed a number of um, uh, things that were were used in the photographic industry at the time and uh, so he he created the swiss journal of photography he wrote a lot about the use of photography uh, but then he was still a young uh, fellow. He was uh, only 25 years old when he met Bertillon in Paris and where he discovered that uh, although he had seen many applications for photography in sciences and in the hospital for x-ray photography, for instance, he found out that Bertillon had developed um, uh, metric photography, that is to reconstitute scenes of crime from photographs and, and make plans uh, using geometrical work really to, to, to make plans. And then he met Bertillon and so Bertillon had been uh, standardizing the mug shot, uh, taking face and side um, uh, of uh, convicted criminals. And he had the chance to go to Paris and, and did the course on uh, anthropometry. And uh, 
So he thought that his background in chemistry and in photography were very interesting for, at the time, what he called police science. The name police science was already used in Italy uh, oh. by some people, but uh, then it was very much criticized by people like Locard that considered that police cannot be scientific. <laughs> um, and um, so he, he developed uh, and he made a first book uh, in 1903 on forensic photography, uh, which was really uh, a huge piece of work. And I find sometimes publication nowadays saying, oh, we have discovered this way of detecting such and such things. Uh, using photographic means and filtering, and it was all described in this book. Wow, that's, that's amazing. So I've seen recent publications saying that there were new ways of imaging and they were already known at the time. So he made a, a very strong contribution, and we were lucky because uh, from 1902 we started to do expert cases for courts and for uh, uh, for justice and um, he continued to develop uh, the technology he continued to develop a number of courses and he gave the first classes in forensic science in 1902 but he was not paid that is he didn't have a position at the university and uh, that's why we were lucky because he was uh, he was rich his family was rich mm. and so he had money he didn't need a salary and for about six or seven years he taught he equipped the laboratory for students without salary wow. and he became well known around around the world so he was hired to give training to the Tsar police in St. Petersburg, to go to Brazil, to give courses, to go to various places. We even have something with the U.S. at one point and, and uh, police people from the U.S. coming to see what he was doing here. Mm. Um, and uh, you remember he was German. He became Swiss uh, after a number of years here. But in 1910, he had a French diplomatic passport because he had sold the big case for the French National Bank on, on counterfeit money, mm -hmm. uh, a case that we have in our museum here still. Mm -hmm. uh, very interesting. So um, uh, he, he became so well known that even Locard at one of their first meeting in 1906 said at one point there is one person I would like to meet it's Rice wow. and Rice was behind him and said Rice it's me so and they met and they were about the same age at the time and they became very good friends so uh, we have records all through the 20 years after uh, exchange of letters and we have photographs with Locard in Lausanne we have a couple of cases that are signed by both Lockard and Rice. Mm -hmm. uh, and I have all the records and all the photographs of these cases. So that's uh, that's fascinating. And at this time, Lockard was in Lyon, France, which is, what, maybe a hundred miles from here? Yeah, two, two and a half hours drive from here. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, it's very, very close indeed. Um, so Rice uh, was a very important person for us because in 1909 the, our government decided to create a new discipline within the university and that was supported by the law faculty and by the science faculty. So because of the reputation of one person mm -hmm. then it became an official uh, forensic science program uh, headed by this person called uh, Rice. Uh, one interesting feature is 1914 he was hired uh, to, uh, as an independent expert, to see the atrocities that were happening uh, between Serbs and Croats. 
and so he went in the war zone and he saw the use of forbidden ammunitions that he uh, described very thoroughly like in a scientific paper but uh, he made this widely known in journals and after a few months he said I cannot remain neutral mm -hmm. so he became a war hero for the Serbs and you go to um, uh, you go to Belgrade nowadays and you find uh, the name of Rice you find a museum with a room on Rice we find a statue mm -hmm. of Rice and he became um, a consultant for King Pierre after the First World War <laughs> on the reorganization of police and, uh, and, and science over there. Um, one interesting thing is that in 1914, because of his engagement on the Serbian side, obviously became a traitor and an enemy for Germany and Austria the, sure. that were uh, the German speaking part of Europe and you find uh, a terrible attack by another of our big pioneers that is Hans Gross mm -hmm. from Austria in 1914 he wrote a pamphlet is that what you call mm -hmm. yes. accusing Rice of all ills and uh, and funnily enough, I found a thesis on the history of criminalistics at the University of Berkeley, California, that is reporting the view of, um, uh, of Gross uh, and deciding that Rice was probably not a good person. <laughs> and this must have been difficult for Rice, being a German, to have his own country, initial country essentially, turn against him. Yes, and and also because he had uh, six or seven brothers, I think two were in the German army mm -hmm. during the war, and two were with the English army. So they had gone to England to fight against Germany. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so it was a, 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 strange, a strange situation. Mm -hmm. But he was a very prolific writer, and uh, we have a, a book on forensic science, which is from 1911, and that was the first of a series that was supposed to become four books, but obviously the war stopped this, so only this book came out. And it's a very interesting book because uh, it considers the use of database, the use of exchange of data internationally. Uh, he had a big discussion at a, a meeting in Monaco that would be the seeds of what would become Interpol later on. Mm. Um, and, uh, so he was very influential at the time and very interesting in, in the way he was seeing also the use of forensic science. I think it was not only to give evidence in court, but it was also information to understand the crime and to understand the action of the criminal. Right which is exactly where we are doing great progress nowadays of using the forensic science data for crime analysis, for forensic intelligence. And this has been a development in our school in the last 20 years, which is directly in line with some of the writing of Rice yeah. about a hundred years ago. That's, <laughs> no, it's, it, it's, it's amazing, and, and you're right, it's one of the things that I I remember first learning about the school was was seeing how information beyond the case, beyond just getting this case out the door, using this information for the bigger picture, whether it's preventative or it's uh, helping investigators see you know a network of of criminal activity and so forth. And I, I was uh, pretty amazed by by that. Yeah. Um, so with respect to the past and the history of forensics. What would you say we're, we are forgetting today? What are some of the modern forensic scientists? First terminology, I wouldn't use forensics, but I would use forensic science. <laughs> sure, sure. <laughs> yes. That's a joke between us. <laughs> yes. Any, well, anyone who knows you knows that you are a very particular person about language and, and terminology. And uh, uh, that's... 
Fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so what would you say that you think it's unfortunate that some of today's modern forensic technicians or scientists are um, losing out on or forgetting about? I I think, uh, and that's uh, I would say that's not original because uh, Paul Kirk in the U.S. said that already in 1963. We are focusing very much on technology and not really focusing on understanding the data that we get yeah. through all these technological development. And if you see, we have batteries of techniques and tests and methods and very little is done with the value and the content of the information that is given by all these technology. So I'm not saying that we should not go for new technologies, but I think we should really focus on what these technology are giving us in the form of results, in the form of information, in the form of uh, evidence sometimes, but I don't think it's the major it's the major point. It may help us avoid uh, uh, errors and things like that. But uh, So I think the progress has been mostly technological, but very little in, in the way the information is, uh, that is used. Mm. And I think that's one of the, of the area that I see some developments currently, but I think it's too slow. Mm. Okay. <laughs> Okay. Well, and, you know, and certainly I, I know in the United States, I, I don't know about here as much, um, you know, there is this push to just get the answer, you know, send the answer to the police, uh, get, get someone an identification, but we never really know what happens to the emperor. It just, it, well, it, to, to me, uh, scientists are investigators. And to me, to say that a police investigator is directing what the scientist should do is a big mistake. Uh, and I know a number of crime labs are directed by policemen or by police officers that have no scientific training. It doesn't mean that they are not good managers, but they are not giving a service to the science that could help them. In the development and I think there should be truly partner and even in some cases be the leaders of investigation mm. because the only remnant true remnant that we can measure from the crime is the trace that we find uh, all the rest you know you can interview people they will tell you black today and white tomorrow and gray the third day uh, your physical uh, trace will give you an information that if you measure it today should be the same tomorrow hopefully <laughs> mm -hmm. so I think I think uh, uh, currently we are using uh, how would I say uh, we are using technicians that will collect trace evidence for analysis in the lab is as if we gave to the uh, ambulance man the role of choosing what you should do in medicine. Mm -hmm. And I think that's an unfortunate situation. Yeah. Okay. All right, so my last question for you, it's a um, philosophical question. If, uh, if Rice were a forensic scientist today, if he could time travel, and he was a forensic scientist today in his modern world, what do you think he would most enjoy? Well, I think he would enjoy the way the school has developed because uh, in his will, when he died, he left a sum of money for our government to keep the uh, school going. And in 1918, when he came back from the war, he saw that one of his students had pursued his ideas. And he said, well, you know, I see that the, my ideas have been taken uh, care of by uh, one of my students. And I don't want to take that from him again. So he left the school and went to uh, co uh, as a consultant for King Pierre. 
uh, but in his will, then he gave a sum of money to the uh, government to keep the uh, the school going. And in fact, I'm still using each year to send somebody to a meeting or something like that, some of this money from the Rice uh, will. And is, is there a name for it, the, the Rice Foundation or something yeah, like something that? something like that, yes. So uh, and uh, uh, so uh, I think... I think he would be pleased to see what has become of this school, especially since, in in, in the word of the uh, dean of the law faculty in 1909, when in 1906, when they decided the creation of the of this institute here, they said, "Well, it's unusual to create a new uh, academic discipline, but we are a small university, and a small university." Uh, may have the chance to build up something that other people will follow later on. And in fact, that was a view that uh, if we see the number of forensic science programs around the world now that have been exploding within the last 10 or 15 years, uh, maybe it was a good decision. Yes. Fantastic. Well, thanks for your time today, and I, I hope the listeners enjoyed enjoyed that. I, I I always enjoy talking with you. You're just a wealth of information about the past and, and history, and a great storyteller as well. So. <laughs> well, and you know, if some people want to see, they can always go on www.unil.ch/esc, /esc, and especially if they go on. Uh, on publications, they will find uh, lots of publications that are in English mm. as well. <laughs> well. What I would recommend is they should come here to meet you personally <laughs> and see this beautiful campus. Well, uh, actually, there were a number of Americans that came here to visit. They were members of the Sherlock Holmes Society. Mm. And the Sherlock Holmes Society is regularly organizing uh, uh, a visit in Switzerland because you know Sherlock Holmes died in Switzerland and they usually come with costumes, nine, 19th century, end of the century uh, costumes and uh, go to various places where uh, Sherlock Holmes had been and usually they stop at the institute here for a <laughs> That's fantastic. short visit because we have a small museum too. Yeah. Great. Well again, thank you very much okay. for your time. You're welcome. Okay. And we're back. Wow, great! Thanks, Glenn, for uh, for sitting down with uh, Professor Marco. That was uh, that was really interesting recap of of his career, and then even before that, uh, a lot of the history of forensic science going back to the, the early twentieth century. Yeah, and and again, thanks to Professor Margot for giving me the time to do that. He's very very busy, but you know he's uh, he's a really he's a very generous man, and uh, just spending time with him. You know, I love his stories, and I love the history and and how rich, you know, the, how rich that history is that he can remind us that you know we're we're kind of forgetting about, and and I love you know, and he makes this point too about you know, he reads these papers, no one's ever done this, and he's like, well, no, actually, <laughs> uh, quite a few people have talked about that. You just have not read their papers. <laughs> right. Uh, I, I I was laughing at that part as well. It sounds like I mean just a fantastic career sounds like he went from from switzerland to uh to england to utah uh, of all places <laughs> yeah of all places yeah and then all the way down to australia uh, with other trips back to switzerland in between and then back uh, all the way back home that that is a uh, yeah. that is a hell of a career you know what i he didn't really talk about um he has a a, a pilot's license and so he was actually flying and running like a little, um, you know, uh, plane back and forth between Utah and Vegas. And he had certain people that he'd fly around. So he's actually a pilot too, which is pretty cool. Wow, that, that that's something. I just made that drive then, last week from from uh, yeah. from Vegas to all the way up to Salt Lake, and flying would have been better. Yeah, and you know, and I guess the you know, lessons and things like that, and the flying was cheaper in the states, so he was able to to you know take up this this hobby but you know he doesn't do it he hasn't done it in a while oh he has he hasn't actually uh, flown then in a while back in switzerland no no uh, that's too bad um 
But what were some of the things that uh, stood out for you? Let me ask you that first. Well, I, I love the connections. It's the, it's the little connections that matter to me. When you see how things happen, you know, when, you know, when you see how Locard and Bertillon and Rice were all kind of together at that time, talking, communicating, sharing ideas, you know, before the internet, before, you know, be, before email. Uh, so, you know, they had to go and visit each other and send letters. And, you know, there was this really cool exchange of, uh, you know, during a time of great change so and, and, and increasing technology and that sort of stuff. So I, I like that element. And, and even today, I mean, I love how, you know, when I see a decision happen at the IAI or, you know, a, a report come out, you know, I know how that committee got together and who got on that committee and, and how they all interact with each other and who, you know, this and that. And I, and I love seeing today how decisions get made when you know all the players involved and their interactions and history. So, I mean, I, I love that kind of stuff. So to me, it's always about the people, not so much the decision, but the people behind it. You get the right mix of people or the wrong mix of people in a certain group and things happen. Yeah, no, you know, I think uh, that would be something interesting to see. Hopefully that's a focus on uh, the IAI's conference coming up in 2015, the 100-year anniversary. I know they're setting up a, a huge museum in the conference with lots of different artifacts and photos and other, lots of stuff uh, on display. And, and hopefully a, lot, a big part of that will be the people that, uh, that started out with the, with the IAI and then all those interactions over time. Yeah, and, and, and truth be told, I don't know a whole lot about the early founders of the IAI and that, that history. I mean, I know there's a few historians of the IAI um, who are very passionate about that, but I've never really, you know, taken the time to learn that. Yeah, well, it looks like uh, the next year and a half or so leading up to that will be the, uh, the perfect time to do that. Anything stood out for you in the interview? Yeah, you know, what, uh, what really uh, kind of caught my ear uh, as I was listening to it was just uh, how uh, interdisciplinary uh, everything seemed uh, for him and his career uh, going from uh, you know working uh, uh, forensically investigating an IRA bombing uh, to um, to studying uh, mushrooms and the different poisons or hallucinogenic effects that can come out from that uh, industrial espionage with with Nestle and uh, uh, then just all the different disciplines that came up, um, you know, over the course of the interview and everything that he's involved with act actually at the Institute. You know, just that doesn't seem to be something that's uh, emphasized anymore when, you know, it, it's each forensic scientist gets one discipline of study for the most part, and then they'll stick with that. And uh, there's not a whole lot of cross-training or, or cross-talk uh, between these different disciplines. Yeah, and you can hear his disappointment a little bit in how we've gone into such individualized silos that, you know, you're a DNA person, you're a fingerprint person. You know, when I asked him the question, you know, I noticed that it wasn't a biology track. You know, his answer being, well, that's because it's all identification. It doesn't matter. And I, I, I like that, you know, and that's definitely something that I began to learn quickly when I came over here and was doing my studies here is just how, as you're pointing to, how interdisciplinary everything is. And all the students here, you know, they spend a great deal of time over, you know, their four years as an undergraduate learning all the different disciplines. And, you know, they will study, you know, these disciplines for several years. You know, they'll study fingerprints for several years while looking at DNA interpretation, while looking at microsc microscopy, while looking at footwear uh, examinations firearms examinations and so forth and that's to me that that's such a great background because it gives them this global view of forensic sciences not this you know um uber specific skill set that you know I, you know you, you you run into i run into fingerprint examiners all the time well that's dna that has nothing to do with fingerprints or you know that's fire that's how firearms people do it that's not how we do it but yet at the end of the day there's quite a bit of similarity in, in these forensic disciplines. Yeah, I'd have to agree as well. Uh, the other thing that, uh, that I, I kind of chuckled at was 
was uh, at some point, and correct me if I'm not hearing, I didn't hear this right, but he said something like uh, DNA was not a forensic science. <laughs> yeah, that's that's what you heard. <laughs> I wouldn't quite go that far, but uh, but I, 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 well, I could see I, his point of of the labs that are that make it robotic and ex- exactly uh, right when it's automated and robotic. You're not using your brain. You're not thinking about interpretation. You're not thinking about its impact, right? It, you're you've just become a monkey pushing buttons. <laughs> right. So uh, again, Glenn, thank you very much for for sitting down with Pierre. Uh, we're looking to get some more interviews uh, out of your time over there in Switzerland. Uh, who, yep, who, starting to line some more up. Uh, who can we look forward to maybe in the next few weeks? Well, I'm I'm hoping we've got some time to get Alice on. Um, let's. Uh, that's what I'm shooting for. Uh, we'll we'll see if we can get Alice. All right, sounds great. Thank you everyone for joining us for another week on the Double Loop Podcast. Again, look for us every Tuesday morning on Stitcher, on SoundCloud, and of course on iTunes. And uh, if you have anything you want to to, uh, to suggest to us or make any comments or questions, uh, get on the show yourself. Send us an email at glenn, G-L-E-N-N, at eliteforensicservices.com. And uh, spread the word. Just tell everyone that you know in forensic science uh, about this podcast, and we'll see if we can keep the listenership up. Uh, Because it's been doing great so far. And you know, Eric, um, we could also, if people want to just call and talk about a case, if they're able to, you know, they can anonymize it. But if they just want to share a particular case with us, you know, people love love that kind of stuff. Exactly. That was uh, some of the the best parts of the conference I was at last week was uh, the discussion on some of the the cases from different uh, detectives that came out and uh, other researchers on uh, some cold cases as well. So... Uh, maybe we can, if you do have an interesting case, uh, yeah, that's absolutely. Give us a call in and, uh, and we'll get you on the show. And uh, you can tell us all about it. And we'll, we'll do our own little cold case files or forensic files kind of show. Yeah, good idea. All right. Well, again, thanks, everybody. And we'll see you next week. Bye. Have a good week. Bye. This podcast is brought to you by Elite Forensic Services. Elite Forensic Services provides quality forensic services by distinguished forensic professionals. We provide expert consultation for prosecution or defense, criminal or civil, on forensic cases and specialize in fingerprints, DNA interpretation, bloodstain pattern, and other types of forensic evidence. We can also provide customizable training and SOP development for your agency. Check out EliteForensicServices.com for upcoming training courses and workshops.